Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen? Amen? You know the young lady that sang just now, Leanne, we met her at our young adult camp meeting, and uh, Maria became friends with her and asked her and Leanne uh, to come to a different church and people you don't know. It takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? So that was very sweet, and it was lovely. It was just lovely, so we were all blessed. So thank you, Leanne. Also, I want to welcome back Ashley from Korea. We are so glad to uh, see you. And uh, did you bring uh, bibimbap and bokimbap and uh, all those bops in your purse? You'll share it. All right. Well, we're so glad to have you and so good to, uh, good to be able to fellowship with you again. I want to give a quick uh, shout out to Eric and Ruth Care. They were really the main organizers of the VBS. They worked tirelessly in it. They worked so hard and we thank them and uh, we're trying to find a way to keep them from Nicaragua uh, that is godly. I just don't know one yet. And uh, so we thank them and then they had great helpers like Nancy and her kitchen crew who just uh, tireless work, uh, great food. The best eating of any BBS in the world will be Northside's. <laughs> Bar none, no doubt. And then like so many other helpers, like the Learneds and Sandy, when the outdoor activities and Dorothy and the uh, McNeils, they just, so many people helped in so many ways. Misty was out there uh, greeting and uh, registering. We just had help everywhere. Uh, but we need way more helpers next year. That would really help. Okay, and uh, one last word before we begin. Uh, Holland begins its county fair booth August 3, and we uh, would love people just to sit at our booth, and uh, when someone wants some literature or something, we can give them. We've ordered some great stuff to pass out. It's not a hard sell. People come to the booth, and they want the stuff. So it's not like you're forcing it on them. Uh, and, but we need people there to give it to them. So if you could ever join us for that, you want to participate, let me know. All right. Please turn to Psalm 117. Psalm 117 is the shortest psalm in Scripture. It is the shortest chapter in the Bible. And did you know it is the center chapter? of the Protestant Bible, center chapter. Just two verses from 17 Hebrew words. <coughs> Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth, for his unfailing love for us is powerful. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Now this psalm is part of six psalms known as the Egyptian Hallel. Does anyone know? That doesn't sound very Christian, does it? If you're not, you know, Egyptian, Hallel. What, what does that mean? What's that referring to? Well, before I give that answer, the Hebrew word, Hallelujah, means what? Praise Yahweh, or as we more commonly say, praise the Lord, right? And these psalms were sung as the Jews celebrated the Passover to remember their deliverance from where? So that's why it's the, the, the praises concerning the deliverance from Egypt, all right? Now, Psalm 113 and 114 were sung before the Passover meal, and Psalms 115 through 118 were sung afterwards. So Psalm 117 was one of the Psalms Jesus and his disciples would have sung on the night he was betrayed and arrested. He sung this very psalm. So it's relevant for our communion service today. The psalm begins, praise the Lord, all you nations, praise him, all you peoples. Now, in secular terms, in the common world, we affirm or praise what we enjoy. But the praise doesn't merely express our enjoyment, it completes it. And I'll give you an example. We delight in our kids and grandkids, 
but our joy is really completed when we tell others about them. And that's why we must endure all the pictures, right? Because telling others, sharing completes praise. Of course, with God, our praise is more than affirmation. It becomes worship because he's our creator. And when our delight in him is so real and so sweet, we move far beyond just praising him at church or in our private devotional time. We tell others about him because, again, sharing completes praise. Isn't that a neat thought? Sharing completes praise. The psalmist wants everyone in the world to praise the Lord along with Israel. So here was a new thought to me. Throughout the centuries, Christians have seen a strong connection in this psalm between praise and mission. This is exciting. A strong connection between praise and mission. In other words, this is a mission-minded praise. This is mission-minded praise. In fact, Benji, I'm going to change the title of my sermon, Mission-Minded Praise, because that's what this is really about. Have you ever thought about God using your praise to reach others for him? Now, he uses literature like we talked about in Bible studies and sermons and things, but this psalm says he uses our praise. It implies he uses our praise to reach others. John Piper sees a connection when he says, I love this, mission is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Why? Because missions exist because worship doesn't. That's powerful. Did you get that? Mission exists because worship doesn't. In other words, mission is necessary because there are people who aren't worshiping the one true God who's worthy of our praise. Do you get that now? Amen. All right. I'm going to say it one more time. Mission is necessary because there are people who aren't worshiping the one true God who's worthy of our praise. The psalmist implies then our praise is how we do mission. When unreached people see how much we value and delight in God, many desire him for themselves. And let me tell you, there are Christians in this world who literally give everything they have, everything for this mission-minded praise. A perfect example of this are the believers in Peshawar, Pakistan. 2013, they were attacked by two Muslim suicide bombers who entered their church service and detonated explosives, killing 127 people, wounding 250 others. The day after the bombing, the members came back to gather the shoes of the children murdered so they could be used by others in the community who had murdered their families. And as they washed the walls of the blood, the secular report said the walls of agony pierced the silence of the indifferent neighborhood around them. But after the walls were clean and after they rearranged their pews, they sat down and began to sing songs of praise to God. They praised God. Why? Because they remembered the charter their church had established over 100 years before. The charter which said, we exist to be a witness for Christ in a major is Islamic city. Were they faithful to that charter? Absolutely. They were truly committed. So they praised him for his unfailing love and faithfulness. Why? To show their delight in the Lord was more than enough to overcome the greatest sorrows of life and by their expression of praise to demonstrate to others that they know a God who's worth giving your whole life to and trusting through anything. 
And though this mission-minded praise was difficult to demonstrate in those circumstances, did you know the Jews had a hard time themselves with the implications of this psalm? It challenged them to the core. The psalmist invites all peoples to join Israel in praising their God. But there was a problem with that. Who were the nations to Israel? They were the goyim, otherwise known as the what? The Gentiles, the non-treasured, non-chosen outsiders whom Israel saw as their what? As their enemies. And, and you want, God, you want our enemies to join us in praising you? You want us to be together? And the psalmist challenges them even further by saying, praise him, all you peoples. The psalmist is saying, Israel, you have a mission. Yahweh is not only Lord of all the nations. He's also the God of all the ethnicities, tribes, races, and backgrounds inside those nations. So, in fact, that's why I chose you. It's your job. Your job to take my love to them so they could one day be full of the very joy and delight that causes you to praise me like you do. Well, they were slow to catch on because even in the New Testament, the Christian Jews began to get upset saying, what are these Gentiles doing coming into our church? Can you imagine if we, we said, what are you converted people doing here in our church? <laughs> Well, who told you you can come in here all converted like that? Well, that would be terrible. Well, what did Paul say in Romans 15? He quotes from this psalm and he says, look, it was the purpose of God from the beginning to have all nations give him praise. That's what this whole thing was all about. By the way, I'd love to slip these things in when I can, just in case you're wondering where we stand. Joshua Project says there are over 16,000 different people groups in the world and close to 7,000 of them are still unreached. Is that accurate? That's what it said. That's 41% of the world's population or close to 3 billion who still aren't praising the God of salvation. All right, but I'm going to challenge you today because I was challenged by preparing this message I'm challenged by this mission-minded message, this psalm, in an even deeper way. Just as the psalmist urges us to love the outsiders, is it possible for God's chosen people today to be no better than the Israelites of old? What do we mean? Well, like the Israelites, can we be, are we more concerned about preserving our identity and traditions than we are about reaching others outside of our zone of safety? Do we feel that Christianity is more of a fortress that we love to hide in and only come out to gather together once a week? Or are we willing to break free of that fortress and, and reach others throughout the community or the world? I'll take a risk and go one step further. Is it also possible to be so insulated so narrowly focused that we're even tempted to look at some within the church as Gentiles, as outsiders. Is that possible? How can that be? Well, we can look at others within our own fellowship as Gentiles, as outside the faith when they don't align with our perspective our viewpoint, and my own traditions. You see, the danger of viewing some members as outsiders is that it makes it easier to treat them as who are the outsiders to the Jews. They were the, their enemy. You see, when you're, my, when you're an outsider to what uh, I believe, you could be my enemy. And then we start labeling when we negatively label someone as liberal or conservative, we've cast them as outside of what, uh, outside of my view. And you know the problem with that? As I've told you before, I, along with all of you, think I'm right. 
I, along with all of you, think I'm the one balanced person in the church. And if everyone believed like me, we'd have no problems. So when I label you, oh, what? That's what you believe? You mean you're not on this side of this position or that side of that position? Then you become an outsider to me. And I may be liberal or I may be conservative or in your mind, I, I don't know, or even in my own mind. But once I label you, once I say you're not like me, then you are an outsider. And I'll tell you the real danger of that. The real danger of that is that when I turn fellow members into a category, when I label them with a, with a little box like liberal or conservative, I turn them into something a little less than human. Now you're just a category. Now you're just a label. Now you're an outsider and now you don't deserve as much respect from me or hearing from me because you're no longer my brother or my sister, you're a category. You're a liberal or a conservative. And what can we do with labels and boxes? They're not alive, we can kick them around. They don't deserve our respect. It is so dangerous, I'm not saying throw away all your positions and your stances. And I'm saying don't label people as outsiders because they disagree with you. They're still your brother and sister. Don't insist on your own way because you think you're the center of rightness because the truth is we all do. And why should I insist on my own way? And well, you've got to do it like me because I'm biblical and you're not. Be careful. Be careful, because that is the perspective of uh, that insulated, narrow thinking where the Jews, God wanted to save the nations of the world, and the Jews said, what? Those outsiders? You think they're worthy to praise God with us? That is the danger. But communion reminds us that we were all outsiders to God. Every single one of us, we were all in the worst category of all, that of lost, rebellious sinners. And yet, while we were his, what? Enemies. He died for us. Communion unifies us in humility and worship, knowing we are all outsiders in need of his grace. That's why we sing together, worthy is the lamb who was slain, because by your blood, you purchase people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And remember, mission exists because worship doesn't. May it never be said that worship doesn't exist here. The kind of worship that gives the respect and honor that each one of us deserves despite our differing viewpoints. At this time, we are going to uh, go to, uh, celebrate the ordinance of humility, the foot washing, and we do this in our Better Living Center in the first door on the right. I'm about to get confused. Who meets in there? Who meets in that first door on the right? The left is men, right? Correct? Who meets there in that right room? Oh, someone tell me the women meet in the Better Living Center. Or is that families? Oh, no. I hope there's deaconesses over there, deacons who can guide you the right way. I am a false shepherd. Do not follow me. I'm going to the men's room, and I know where that is. I, I mean where we're having foot washing. <laughs> I'm, oh boy, I want to disappear. All right. Come back. Let's serve the Lord together. Thank you.